Uh, let's just uh, try to frame what's uh, going on in uh, this time we find ourselves. Um, this secular time, I realize we probably all have different ways of understanding that term. Um, but also I need to frame it in terms of my own 40 plus years of engagement with uh, Buddhism or the Dharma, as I would far prefer to call it. And my practice, as was uh, mentioned, started as a Tibetan Buddhist monk in the Gelugpa tradition, uh, where I trained with Geshe Rabten <coughs> and other lamas. I then did a four-year training in uh, Korean Son, or Zen. And uh, since I've been back in the West, uh, my interest <coughs> has largely focused on the practice of Vipassana, uh, mindfulness and so on, and uh, an ongoing study of the discourses primarily within the Pali <coughs> Canon. And uh, this has been, I, I'm not an academic, I don't have any uh, credentials to be here really. Um, I have no university degree, I've never been to university or college. Uh, my training has always been in the context of uh, living traditions. I can't, in good faith, uh, consider a classical Buddhist text as though it is an object of, uh, of, of, of scientific scrutiny. Uh, I read and ponder and engage with these texts in order to hear what they have to say to my own personal condition and the condition of our times. And from my Tibetan teacher's point of view, my progress in Buddhism over these years has, strictly speaking, been a regress where having started with the Vajrayana and then downgraded to the Mahayana and then downgraded further to the Hinayana and um, now I'm feeling I'm sort of just going off the map from that categorization altogether to uh, consider what is now increasingly being called early Buddhism. Again, this is probably understood in different ways, but broadly speaking, early Buddhism would be those teachings of the Buddha uh, that um, are broadly speaking found in the Pali Nikayas, uh, but also in their Chinese equivalents. Uh, we also have some of them translated into Tibetan. Um, but let's just stay with the Pali Nikayas for the time being. And I'm particularly interested in those teachings that, uh, of, uh, which are attributed to uh, the historical Buddha, uh, but which cannot really be derived, as far as we can tell, from the um, Indian culture, religious framework, philosophy of his period. In other words, what I'm looking for are those teachings which seem to be original and distinctive to this historical person who taught these uh, practices, these systems of ethics and philosophy in the conditions of his seculum, of his age, uh, as um, a person living in that time in India all those uh, hundreds of years ago. Um, and I feel, and again, I might be wrong, of course, that the further we go back to the source, the closer we get to what we can reasonably uh, reconstruct as the teachings of this man, uh, strike me as having um, a degree of universality uh, that is not perhaps the case in some of the orthodox Buddhist traditions that have been framed by uh, Indian Brahmanic culture or they've been framed by Chinese culture or Tibetan culture, um, which of course were also uh, attempts to formulate Buddhist teaching and practice in a way that spoke to the needs and the conditions of people living in, let's say, 3rd century AD um, India or 6th century AD China or 12th century AD Tibet. So what is going on in um, our time is nothing at all different from what has gone on throughout Buddhist history. 
Buddhism for me is not primarily a metaphysical uh, set of truth claims or a belief system or a set of dogmas that need to be preserved intact over the centuries, but rather it's a tradition of practice that addresses the core concerns, the core suffering of human beings, and in doing so uh, is constantly being uh, reinvented, re-articulated. And so when I talk about early Buddhism for secular times, I'm trying, through my own personal passions and needs, to recover some of these earliest strata of the Buddhist uh, tradition, those that are not yet inflected so strongly by Indian, Chinese, Tibetan, and other cultural uh, discourses, in order uh, to articulate those core values and concerns uh, to a world like the one we live in now, which we will loosely describe as secular. By secular, um, I don't just mean not religious. I think that's uh, uh, certainly the way the word is often used in popular discourse. But secular for me has its roots um, in the etymology of the word, uh, seculum, which means our age, the kind of you know, period in history that we currently inhabit. And for many people today, having been brought up in the uh, social and political culture that stemmed from the European Enlightenment, from the suspicion of religious or revealed authority that likewise began in that period, um, and a world which of course nowadays is deeply informed by our understanding of the human being, uh, the environment, the world we live in, from the natural sciences. Um, this is a frame that's really quite different from any of the traditional frames um, of Asian cultures in which Buddhism has hitherto been articulated. I think also we are at a period um, uh, where there is a beginning of another wave of uh, interest and engagement with Buddhist teachings, uh, and curiously, uh, teachings that come from the earliest strata of the tradition. And um, much of this, I feel, is due to the work of uh, John Kabat-Zinn, the whole mainstreaming of mindfulness. And just to give you an example of how this is uh, playing out now, two weeks ago, in the British Houses of Parliament, the all-party parliamentary committee on mindfulness, <laughs> it exists, <coughs> I didn't make that up, it's not a Monty Python joke. <laughs> uh, uh, delivered its uh, policy, it's, it's a, a document of policy proposals uh, to the British government where they are um, advocating the use and the application of mindfulness in the fields of healthcare, education, the workplace, and the military. This will now be taken up by the different government departments and uh, consider to see whether, in fact, this will be taken forward so that possibly in a few years' time, uh, mindfulness will be part of the British na uh, national curriculum. It's already being uh, employed in the National Health Service. Uh, there's possibilities, likewise, that it'll be brought into, um, in, 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 into uh, employment and, and labor uh, fields and so forth and so on. Of course, we don't know what's going to happen. But if someone had told me this uh, 40 years ago, when I was a young, idealistic Tibetan Buddhist monk in Dharamsala, that in 40 years' time, uh, the British government would be adopting Buddhist practices, and I would have thought they were completely bonkers, uh, or fantasists, or people who had taken too many mind-altering substances. But it has come to pass. Uh, and I find that quite extraordinary. Um, uh, it's so extraordinary that I can't even quite fully compute or, 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 in a sense, digest that this is happening. I would never have imagined it. In my own practice, um, after a number of years uh, studying in the Gelugpa School of Tibetan Buddhism, 
well, two or three years, actually. Uh, I'd just become a, a novice Buddhist monk. And for some reason, for reasons for which I still don't fully understand, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama invited uh, um, Satya Narayan Goenka, Mr. Goenka, uh, to teach a 10-day Vipassana retreat in the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives in Dharamsala. And this was both for the young Tibetan monks who were at the dialectical school in Dharamsala and whoever of the Western students who were studying in the library. And uh, the library was turned into a temporary 10-day retreat center. And um, I was very curious to know what this was all about. And I did this 10-day retreat. And for the first time, I was introduced to the practice of mindful attention, satipatthana, primarily focused on the breath, of the body, the sensations within the body, and the Vedana, the, the feeling tones associated with that experience. And this for me was a completely uh, transformative event. Um, it introduced me for the first time to a form of practice that didn't involve uh, uh, reflections or concepts, it didn't involve visualizations, it didn't involve mantras, there was no intermediary um, uh, uh, there was no intermediary medium uh, through which I was engaging in meditational practice, but I, for the first time, was given tools to concentrate and focus and still the mind and turn that attention uh, in a completely uh, you know, uncompromising way to the primacy of my actual experience here and now. And since that point, that um, quality of attention has been the bedrock of all the practices I've done since. And it continues to be. And this is, of course, uh, a practice going back to the, uh, the, the, the Satipatthana Sutta, the Discourse on the Foundations of Mindfulness in the Pali Canon, uh, which likewise Mr. Goenka cited and introduced us to. And that had uh, a profound uh, transformative effect in my life. And I also, though, have to acknowledge that when I did that 10-day retreat, I had spent the last two or three years immersed in Buddhist uh, philosophy slash theology, the Dharma studies. Um, I'd done a lot of Lamrim type reflections, which basically uh, describe uh, through a series of contemplations the structure of the Buddhist path, in other words, uh, providing a, a, a vision of what human life is for, providing a vision of the core values, the core philosophical ideas. Uh, and I don't think that had I done that retreat without that framework, it would have had the effect that it did. In other words, um, it brought in an element that uh, in a way grounded uh, or yeah, yeah, grounded my practice and my understanding of the Dharma in the felt experience of uh, my moment-to-moment -moment existence. So um, what I feel uh, we somehow need uh, today um, is that this practice of mindfulness uh, be one that is embedded uh, and uh, uh, understood within an ethical and a philosophical outlook. I don't think that necessarily need be Buddhist in any explicit way. But I do feel that if the integrity of the tradition is to, uh, in a sense, bear its fullest fruit, uh, that we need more than just the, the formal exercise of mindful attention. We need somehow to, uh, in a way, do a similar kind of transformation to the Buddhist tradition in terms of an ethical and a philosophical um, framework um, that I think, again, is not something that uh, is an necessarily part of the Buddhist religion but has also a universality about it that can likewise speak very directly to the conditions of our time and our age. Another practice 
uh, that for me was very central in my own uh, uh, experience of the Dharma was the uh, study of the, uh, the koan, or the huadu, as they call it. Um, I learned this in South Korea, where I was a, a Buddhist monk for about four years, uh, training in a monastery where, uh, th for six months of the year, three months in the summer, three months in the winter, um, we would uh, meditate for 10 to 12 hours a day, focusing entirely on the question, what is this? Um, now, it may not sound like everybody's idea of a lot of fun, but um, this came at a time in my life where that was precisely what I needed or felt I needed uh, to do, something of that order. In other words, a meditation practice that's not just about paying attention, but a practice that <laughs> seeks to um, to embody the primary uh, questions of what it means to be here at all, what we might call existential questions. What is the meaning of life? What, is, uh, what does it mean uh, to be fully human? What is this is a more about cultivating um, a, a quality of curiosity, perplexity, wonder, awe, that is not just a transient sort of mental um, experience going on in the head, but is actually embodied, that you ask with your body and mind um, in such a way that you can let go of the words of the question and you can somehow uh, bring that quality of mystery, of wonder, perplexity uh, in, su in such a way that it inf infuses one's consciousness of each moment. Um, and that, I feel, is perhaps what we might in, again, I'm not very fond of the word spiritual, but this to me is really the deep spiritual or religious question that lies at the root uh, of these practices. I feel that this is in, more, in Indian Buddhism, this is perhaps best expressed through the legend of the Buddha, the story of his growing up as a privileged prince inside a palace, um, then one day deciding he wants to see what's on the other side of those walls, and he encounters a sick person, an aging person, a corpse, and that uh, enables him for the first time, so the legend goes, to become aware of the primary questions of his own existence. And I can only really understand the Buddha's awakening or enlightenment as a moment or a series of moments in which he arrived at a resolution of some kind to those primary existential questions. So I think that if the practice of, of mindfulness is to be further um, developed, and uh, contextualized, I feel that both the ethics, the philosophy, and also a deeper living or live sense of the sheer mystery of being uh, a sentient being uh, are somehow integrated into this process. Now, how this is going to be done, I honestly don't know. I don't think for a moment that it will be the work of any single person. I think it's very much um, a concern that I know I share with many of my colleagues and friends um, uh, to work towards this uh, articulation of a vision, really, uh, that perhaps will take, as these Buddhist movements have taken in, uh, in, in uh, the, his hi the history of the tradition, it may take generations, I don't know. I feel that at our times we have far greater and more immediate access to uh, teachings, to information, to data, particularly now with uh, you know, cyber technologies and so on. But I don't know whether the actual um, evolving of the Dharma uh, is just a question of having you know, more knowledge. I think of the Dharma in history as something more comparable to a living organism, 
uh, that adapts and evolves to changing circumstances um, in a kind of more organic, uh, rather, um, you know, in a much slower sense of time. It's not something, certainly, that will just be achieved by some clever person coming up with a brilliant theory. That might be necessary, too. But for it to be a living thing in our secular age, it needs to be somehow digested, internalized, and articulated uh, in forms that um, uh, will perhaps only become evident uh, over uh, longer periods of time. I think also what is crucial in this process is the integration of the arts into the Dharma. Um, I'm aware, of course, that there's a lot of discussion about Buddhism and science. And I think that's a, a wonderful thing. But I wish there were more uh, reflection and discussion and uh, communication between the Dharma and the imagination, particularly the creative imagination as it finds itself through, expressed through uh, both uh, the visual arts, uh, poetry, uh, literature, theater, film, and so on. There are signs of this. Uh, Last couple of years ago, a novel was published by Ruth Ozeki, uh, who is a Zen priest living uh, off one of the, on one of the islands off the west coast of Canada, uh, called A Tale for the Time Being, which was shortlisted for the Booker Prize uh, about two years ago, uh, and is a wonderful integration of Buddhist uh, uh, teaching, primarily from uh, Dogen in this case, but embedded, I think, quite effortlessly and seamlessly into a contemporary literary narrative. Uh, and the fact that it was accepted uh, in the mainstream of literary culture is indicative of, of these teachings somehow uh, having, getting out of the ghetto of Buddhism and speaking to a much uh, wider public, much in the same way that mindfulness has got out of the ghetto of Buddhism and is now engaging with people's lives elsewhere. But I'd like to uh, spend the remaining uh, 15 or so minutes that I have in this presentation by trying to consider how we might uh, rethink the Dharma uh, from the ground up. That was actually my original subtitle, but the publisher didn't like it. Uh, I think mainly because it's difficult to end a, a, a title on the word with the word up. It looks odd. In any case, that's probably a more accurate account of what it is I think uh, I'm involved in and what many others likewise, I think, are considering. Um, again, this return to the early tradition is not, for me, um, uh, you know, a, a hopefully subject to what's sometimes called the genetic fallacy, namely, if it's earlier, it's better and truer because there's plenty of material in the Pali Canon that I don't think is terribly helpful. Um, so it's a question of teasing out those uh, early doctrines, most of which we'll find in all Buddhist traditions. They're not exclusive to that tradition. And the teaching that I feel almost without question is the one that people will regard as, as, as foundational to Buddhist thought and practice is that of the Four Noble Truths. So how are we to uh, consider these Four Noble Truths, these Four Truths, in a way that might uh, allow us to think of them in a more secular frame without reference to uh, past and future lifetimes, without having to uh, adopt the metaphysical belief, as I think it is, that uh, craving or ignorance and craving are somehow the cause of reincarnation and keep us spinning around in the cycle of birth and death, um, which is implicit in the doctrine of the Four Noble Truths. I also don't think it's uh, uh, so uh, totally useful to try to psychologize that teaching and to think of, of craving as somehow generating a kind of psychological anguish or a sort of a mental suffering. Uh, and the rest of the suffering we can kind of just put to one side. My sense is that when we consider the uh, Buddha's first discourse, which is called the uh, 
the turning of the wheel of Dhamma, although that's not the title given in the, in the, in, uh, in, in the canon itself. When we get to the end of it, that discourse, it's very short, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, uh, the Buddha recognizes that, and I'm going to quote from memory here, that when only when my knowledge and vision was entirely clear about the twelve aspects of the four truths, could I consider myself to have attained a peerless awakening in this world? <coughs> now this, of course, is a very, um, I think, authoritative uh, statement about the nature of awakening itself, or enlightenment. Awakening or enlightenment here is not understood as gaining um, a privileged, uh, contemplative insight into the nature of some ultimate truth, be it emptiness or the nature of mind or nirvana. But awakening is understood as um, understanding the twelve aspects of the four truths. What are these twelve aspects? Each of the four truths are to be recognized, uh, performed, and accomplished, it says. In other words, uh, each truth is to be related to in a particular way. It's not that all four truths are to be understood or known. But the first truth, that of dukkha, is to be embraced. Uh, the word is parinya, which means fully understood. The second of the truths, craving, is to be released or let go of, I would prefer. The third truth of the stopping of craving is to be realized, to be seen clearly and directly for oneself. And the fourth truth, that of the Eightfold Path, is to be brought into being, to be realized, to be cultivated in some way. Now once we start to shift the focus from truths to these four tasks, we move from a truth-based metaphysic into a task-based ethic. And again, I'm using the word ethic here not as a synonym for morality, but I'm using the word ethic as it was used by the Greeks, um, which is really talking about a, a life of practice, uh, not just um, spiritual practice, but an engagement with our life and the world that has seceded from our instinctive impulses, attachments, fears, drives, and so forth and so on, and chooses consciously to lead a human life that uh, seeks to realize the values that are most um, central in our intuitive life, our communal life, in such a way that we, uh, s that we achieve or we aspire to achieve becoming the sort of person we seek to be. Ethics comes from the Greek ethos, which means character. It's about, <laughs> ethics is about the uh, practice of being human, the practice of emerging uh, consciously into a, uh, a person whose life, from the way he or she sees the world, makes ethical or moral choices, uh, speaks and communicates, acts physically, engages in livelihood and work, focuses their energies, pays mindful attention, and develops concentration, which are, of course, the eight steps of the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is uh, an ethic in that sense. And if we think of the four truths um, in terms of being tasks, things to do, the whole practice is essentially ethical in that broader sense. And this ethos, this ethic, this practice begins with um, uh, fully knowing dukkha. Now dukkha we can loosely translate as suffering, but uh, 
as the Buddha defines it in this first text, it clearly refers more than just to personal discomfort or pain. It has to do with the existential situation we find ourselves in. It has to do with birth, sickness, aging, death. It has to do, as he says at the end of the definition, with the five aggregates of clinging. In other words, the, uh, the totality of our experience uh, in all of its complexity uh, in every single moment. How do we embrace that? How do we uh, uh, approach and uh, understand and uh, empathize and relate to this experience um, of life? Frankly, dukkha is, um, to me, almost synonymous with life as we use the word life in English as, well, that's life. <laughs> C'est la vie. Something unpleasant or, 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 or painful happens and we say, well, that's life. Now, by life in that context, we don't mean biological life. We mean life in the sense of an experience that is um, inescapably uh, shot through with a certain sense of the tragic. Uh, the English word, I think, also that works quite well here is poignancy. There's something very poignant to our lives. And the more we pay attention to these Buddhist ideas like <coughs> impermanence, uh, not-self, the impersonality of our physical, mental life, um, we realize that however joyous a particular moment in our experience might be, uh, that it will end. That there's something profoundly poignant about even the most joyous experiences that we can undergo. So I think the w I mean, we don't have time now, but you can of course read this at great length in my book. <laughs> you can, we can see that this idea of embracing or fully knowing dukkha um, is really entering into a very different relationship to our life in that sense. Uh, I think it has uh, a cognitive element. I think it's important to pay attention to those features of our experience that we tend to ignore or overlook or deny, like impermanence and death. It also has an affective quality. In other words, it opens up another way of feeling about ourselves, feeling about others who, like ourselves, also suffer. And I would argue that it has an aesthetic dimension as well. I mean, a good example of that would be, why do we go to watch a play like Macbeth or Hamlet? Uh, this is very far from a screwball romantic comedy, which is a laugh a minute. In fact, these plays uh, are bringing us into uh, uh, contact with some of the deepest dilemmas and tragedies of our, well, they're called tragedies. Drama for Aristotle was always tragedy. And uh, I feel that the arts, too, you see, are a wonderful medium for bringing us into this fully knowing of dukkha through uh, theater, in this case, or movies, or literature, and so on. And I think the West is very, uh, has a very rich artistic tradition uh, that is not reducible to mere entertainment, but is actually, for many people, the way that they enter into a more contemplative relationship with the very core uh, issues of what it means to suffer. When we encounter a world, an environment, um, but be it a, a simple dispute we might have in our family or uh, some uh, success we might be having at work, or simply we're walking through the countryside and enjoying the beautiful autumn le fall leaves. Um, we realize also that every experience provokes a kind of reaction within us. And these reactions, some reactions, of course, are wonderful. We, 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 we experience a reaction of, of kindness or generosity or insight or wisdom. And of course, these qualities, again, universally human, um, 
are, are things that are integral to the practice and the path itself. These would constitute you know, the fourth task of cultivating the path. But the Buddha sees himself as a physician, as a doctor. His teaching is basically remedial and therapeutic. And so it focuses on those kinds of reactions that we have that uh, don't get us anywhere, often cause an enormous amount of grief, and perhaps most importantly, I would argue, they prevent us from entering the stream of an ethical life. They keep us going round and round in uh, habitual patterns of self-attachment, uh, self-interest, almost a kind of narcissistic self-regard, and thereby uh, stunt and stymie our actual uh, potential for human flourishing. Again, this is a term taken from the Greeks, eudaimonia, which I think likewise is precisely what the Eightfold Path is about. But for this path to enable such flourishing, it means that we need to find uh, freedom from those counter forces that block access to such a life. And these are often then known by a number of different terms in Buddhism. Perhaps the earliest one is the idea of the three fires. The fire of greed, the fire of hatred, and the fire of delusion or confusion. And I think the notion of fire, um, again, is, is very telling. In other words, when an organism uh, encounters an attractive or an unattractive or a distressing or a pleasing object that is like a match striking a matchbox and something flares up. Greed and hatred, etc., flare up within us. So the second task is the task of letting go of those destructive negative habits of our organism. And again, these destructive negative habits are only destructive in the sense that they prevent a full flourishing of what is humanly possible, but they are, of course, simply the legacy of our evolution, that they would now be understood as being embedded in our neurobiology. I've been told probably in the limbic system. I actually don't have a clue what the limbic system is, <laughs> but uh, that is apparently where they are. But what it points to is that these are things that we're not going to somehow be able to magically delete by doing enough meditation retreats. Uh, these are built into our, into our organism. And they served enormous survival, uh, they've been of enormous advantage to us in the process of, of surviving and evolving and becoming the kind of beings we are now. So the second task, rather than uh, thinking of the second noble truth as craving is the origin of suffering, um, which is basically a metaphysical claim. I don't think it's really that much different from craving is from, you know, God created heaven and earth, frankly. If we look at this in terms of it being something to do rather than something to believe or know, then it's a practice of letting go of this reactivity. But what does that mean? to let go of greed, to let go of hatred. I th sometimes it's translated as abandon, which I think is rather too strong and has a very close affinity to my mind with some kind of aversive rejection. Whereas in the actual practice of uh, attention and mindfulness, it's not got anything to do with trying to get rid of something. It has to do with learning to see these processes for what they are. To be able to bear witness, to experience the rising up of these patterns, but not to identify with them, not to get caught up in them, not to let them run the show, but instead cultivate an open, non-reactive space of awareness in which we can see them arise, and if they're left to their own devices, they will naturally fizzle out and come to an end. And the first uh, discourse, in fact, concludes with the phrase, which is a sort of a, 
a slogan of the early Buddhist community, whatever, has the, whatever is subject to arising is subject to ceasing. That, to me, is the very core of what this practice is about. In allowing these reactions to come to a stop, even momentarily, we open up a space of possibility in which we can think and speak and act in a way that's not conditioned by those uh, habits and drives and patterns. And those moments of stopping are, in some sense, moments of nirvana. In other words, the absence of greed, of hatred, of confusion. Tempor temporary, perhaps, but nonetheless moments of potential freedom that are not an end in themselves, but they offer us the possibility of another beginning. They offer us the possibility of thinking, speaking, acting in a way that's no longer driven by these kinds of destructive habits of body and mind. And that's what leads us into the stream of the path itself, what the Buddha calls entering the stream. And then we have um, the potential uh, to, in a sense, redefine, reconfigure how we live in our own thoughts, in our words, in our deeds. And that is the practice. That is the ethical practice. And in some way, all of these four tasks uh, are totally interwoven one with the other. It's not as though they're four totally separate things. Embrace suffering, let go of craving, experience the stopping of craving, cultivate the path. For didactic purposes, yes, it's possibly helpful to think of them as discrete uh, tasks or acts. But experientially, in living life from moment to moment, it might be more helpful to think of them as four aspects of a single task or a single practice. And in any case, I have to stop here. The, you can, if you, I don't know if you can read that at the back. The, uh, this boils down to what I call ELSA. Embrace, let go, see or stop. I, I go back and forth with that one. And act. Um, and this action, again, is not... I, I want to get out of this idea that we're considering this path as a, as a linear progression from A to Z, but rather to think of this as something more akin to a positive feedback loop. Because when we get, if we embrace the condition we're in, we let go of the reactions, we see clearly the moments when those reactions are suspended or stopped, that allow the opportunity to act unconditioned by them, that brings us through speech, acts, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, concentration, back to the first task, embracing the condition we're in. What are we mindful and what do we concentrate on? We concentrate on what is unfolding in our life now. And so like a positive feedback loop, we return to where we started, but at a deeper pitch, as it were. And that, to me, describes the evolution of this practice um, as one that is um, essentially ethical. It's in terms of what we do to, uh, in the process of becoming the kind of person we aspire to be. And again, it might start as a personal practice. I think inevitably, for most of us, it will. But that can never be understood in isolation from uh, a person who is inevitably a part of a community, of a society, of a, a, a race, of, a for, of sentient beings. We are inevitably entangled one with the other. And as we again know from the natural sciences, that everything from carrots to ducks to human beings all stems from the same basic stuff of DNA. Uh, this is what unites us as living beings. Um, and this practice is one, I would argue, 
uh, is that of learning to become a practicing human, to make human being our practice. And once we, once we can start to look at the Buddha's teaching in this way, um, there seems to be really little need for adhering to many of the classical religious doctrines of Buddhism. Uh, we enter into a form of practice that engages the whole of ourselves, uh, that seeks meaning and value and purpose, that is healing and restorative, not just for ourselves, but for the world of which we are an intrinsic part. And that uh, I would present to you as uh, a tentative vision of how early Buddhism might be able to speak to the suffering of our secular age. Thank you. <laughs>